when, when Jesus is my portion, a constant friend is he. His eyes on, on the sparrow, and he watches over me. That's got to get in our bones, church. Anyway, happy Mother's Day. I'm already crying. We're 30 seconds in. Um, one of my favorite movies growing up was this movie called, it was just on constant repeat in our house. It was called Cool Runnings. Have you seen this movie, Cool Runnings? It came out in the late 80s, early 90s. If you haven't seen this movie, you need to make some significant life changes because this movie is just awesome. Let me tell you why it's so awesome. Just catch you up quickly. So the movie tracks this story of these four Jamaican sprinters who were trying to make it to the 88 Olympics. So it's moving along. They're Jamaican. They're fast. They got a history of having sprinters in the Olympics in Jamaica. You know the whole thing. So they're, they're ready to, to qualify. They're at the race. And during the middle of the race, one of the guys trips and falls, and then just like when you've ice skating with somebody who's never ice skated, uh, he falls, and then they fall, and the other guys fall, and so they're just completely devastated because they see all their hopes of making the Olympics just like lying in pieces on the floor. There's this real somber moment in the movie where, where everything's broken, not as it should be, until it dawns on one of them that maybe we can still make it to the Olympics by forming a, wait for it, a bobsled team. You heard that right, a bobsled team. Now, I don't know what you know about bobsledding, but, but here's what you've got to have to pull off bobsledding. You know what it is? Snow and ice. I don't know the last time you went to Jamaica, but you know what there's not any of hardly ever? Snow and ice. So, but somehow, some way, these four knuckleheads put a team together, but they got to find a coach. And man, did they find a coach. Remember this, this part of the week? They find a coach who, who got, got a shady past, but, but his name is Irving Blitzer. That's just a great name for a bobsled coach. Irving Blitzer. Now, here's what we know about Irving Blitzer. That brother is shady as all get out. Like, we know some people in our life like that, right? Like, they're just 90% wholesome folk, but there's just like 10% of shady. You got to watch them. So, actually, he was in the 72 Olympics and got his medal taken from him because he cheated in bobsleds. So, that's their coach. Fast forward, they make it to the Olympics, and, and it's just a train wreck. Like, they don't know how to push the thing, drive the thing, stop the thing. It's just a disaster. And they finally figure it out in the last race of the Olympics, and they're coming around a curve. And, and remember what happens? One of, their, one of their little sleds just detaches from the thing. One of their little, little blades detaches from the sled. And they go bumbling and fumbling and tumbling, just a, a mangled mess. And the last scene of the movie, they, they pick up their sled and walk it across the finish line. So yeah, they, they were completely embarrassed. But man, they made it and they finished. Now, let me tell you why I love that movie and why I think that story, even if you haven't seen it, Go watch it. What will resonate with you? Because that story is actually a gospel story. Now, when you're watching that movie, you don't think like that, but let me tell you why it's a gospel story. It's got an impossible rescue, impossible redemption, a group of nobodies from Jamaica who have no experience whatsoever bobsledding are going to the Olympics. It's got inadequate people. Just watch the movie. They're about as clueless and hopeless and helpless as it's possible to be. And yet somehow they step in to recognition. It's got impossible rescue, inadequate people. It's got an improbable mediator. Somebody who steps in as shady and crooked and, and, and busted up as Irving Blitzer is. He's going to be your guy to take you to the Olympics. So you've got impossible rescue, inadequate people, improbable mediator. And that's the gospel. And so what, what, I, what, I want, what I want you to see this morning from, from Exodus is that Exodus is not just, it's not just that story plays out in cool runnings. It plays out over and over and over again in the book of Exodus. Well, let me show you what I'm talking about. Exodus chapter 13 is where we're going to be. Exodus 13, we're going to start in verse 17 and, and really read through the end of chapter 14. I'm going to read a lot of text this morning. But I just want to show you why the Exodus story is ultimately a gospel story. And here's, what, here's why it's important for us to get that. Because listen, regardless of how you showed up this morning, like, like whether your mom birthed you on the front pew on Mother's Day Sunday, or this is your first time in church in 20 years, 
Here's what we know. All of us are broken. All of us are busted up. Anybody in here who doesn't have a struggle, a stressor, an anxiety, a worry, a care that's just weighing you down? Am I lying up here? Am I alone? We all show up just busted and fractured to kingdom come. And we need somebody who isn't to step into our place and bring us into redemption. Man, we need an exodus. We need an exodus. We need freedom. We need hope. We need peace. We need joy. And that's the story that unfolds in Exodus. So pick it up, Exodus chapter 13. We'll start in verse 17. If you don't have a Bible, there should be a hardback maroon one on the, on the back of the seat in front of you. If you don't own one, just take that one. It's our gift to you. Uh, don't put it in your trunk. Just leave it here if you're going to do that. But if you, if you would like a, a Bible to take home and read and, and see, we're not making any of this up. Take that one. It's our gift to you. My name is Patrick. I'm glad you're here. Stop by Connection Central. If you're new, we'd love to connect with you. Exodus chapter 13. We'll start in verse 17. Let me just quickly set up the text. So at the end of chapter 12, God unfurls the tenth plague. What was it? The death of every firstborn male, cattle, lamb, goat, all livestock, and of the firstborn sons in Egypt. So in the middle of the night, at the end of chapter 12, you hear in the distance a scream. You hear a mother's shriek as she shakes her baby, and it doesn't move. And, and you hear that over and over and over again. And Pharaoh says, get out of here. This is too much. So, so God leads his people out of Egypt. That's where we pick it up in the story. A lot of text this morning. It's up on the screen. So just hang in there. Exodus 13. We'll start in verse 17. When Pharaoh finally let the people go, God did not lead them along the main road that runs through Philistine territory, even though that was the shortest route to the promised land. God said, if the people are faced with the battle, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led them in a roundabout way through the wilderness toward the Red Sea. Thus the Israelites left Egypt like an army ready for battle. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him. For Joseph had made the sons of Israel swear to do this back in Genesis 50. He said, God will certainly come to help you. And when, not if, but when he does, you must take my bones with you from this place. So the Israelites left Succoth and camped at Etham on the edge of the wilderness. The Lord went ahead of them. He guided them during the day with a pillar of cloud, and he provided light at night with a pillar of fire. This allowed them to travel by day or by night. The Lord did not remove the pillar of cloud or pillar of fire from its place in front of the people. He was with them. 14, verse 1. Then the Lord gave these instructions to Moses. Order the Israelites to turn back and camp by Pahiharoth between Migdal and the sea. Camp there along the shore, across from Baal Zephon. Then Pharaoh will think, the Israelites are confused. They're trapped in the wilderness. What are they doing? And once again, God says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will chase after you. I have planned this in order to display my glory through Pharaoh and his whole army. After this, the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. That's the refrain throughout the book. So the Israelites camped there as they were told. Verse 5. When word reached the king of Egypt that the Israelites had fled, Pharaoh and his officials did what? Exactly what God said they'd do. They changed their minds. What have we done? Letting all these Israelite slaves get away, they asked. So Pharaoh harnessed his chariot and called up his troops. He took with him 600 of Egypt's best chariots, along with the rest of the chariots of Egypt, each with its commander. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. So he chased after the people of Israel, who had left with fists raised in defiance. The Egyptians chased after them with all the forces in Pharaoh's army, all his horses and chariots, his charioteers and his charioteers and his troops. The Egyptians, this is an intense moment in the scene. Get the, get the picture. So Israelites, they just left Egypt. Pharaoh is enraged. All Egyptians are, are enraged because of them. They've lost their firstborn cattle, firstborn son. So they're chasing after them. And th- this is a really tense moment. What happens in verse Verse 9, the Egyptians chased after them with all the forces in Pharaoh's army, all his horses, chariots, chariots, and troops. The Egyptians 
caught up with the people of Israel as they were camped beside the shore near Pahiroth, across from Baal Zephon, which is exactly where God told him to go. That's crazy. You, you, you should be like, what in the world is going on there? As Pharaoh approached, the people of Israel looked up and they panicked. Four verses earlier, they're, they're in bold defiance. One look at the Egyptians and they panicked. They cried out to the Lord and they said to Moses, Why did you bring us out here to die in the wilderness? Weren't there enough graves for us in Egypt? What have you done to us? Why did you make us leave Egypt? Didn't we tell you this would happen while we were still in Egypt? We said, leave us alone. Let us be slaves to the Egyptians. It's better to be a slave in Egypt than a corpse in the wilderness. But Moses told the people, do not be afraid. Just stand still. Watch the Lord rescue you today. Some of you need to hear that this morning. The Egyptians you see today will never be seen again. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the people to get moving. Pick up your staff, raise your hand over the sea, divide the water. Divide the water. Does that sound crazy to you? Divide the water so the Israelites can walk through the middle of the sea on dry ground. And I'll harden the hearts of the Egyptians. They'll charge in after the Israelites. My great glory will be displayed through Pharaoh and his troops, his chariots, his charioteers. When my glory is displayed through them, all Egypt will see my glory and know that I am the Lord. Then the angel of God, who had been leading the people of Israel, moved to the rear of the camp. The pillar of cloud also moved from the front and stood behind them. The cloud settled between the Egyptian and Israelite camps. As darkness fell, the cloud turned to fire, lighting up the night. But the Egyptians and Israelites did not approach each other all night, for if they had, the Israelites would have been destroyed. This is God protecting his people. This next scene is one of the most history-shaping, people-defining, mind-boggling moments in the scriptures. Verse 21. Then Moses did what? He raised his hand over the sea. And what happened? The Lord opened up a path through the water with a strong east wind. The wind blew all that night, turning the seabed into dry land. So the people of Israel walked, listen to the sentence, walked through the middle of of the sea (laughs) on dry ground with walls of water on each side. Then the Egyptians chased them into the middle of the sea. But just before dawn, the Lord looked down on the Egyptian army from the pillar of fire and cloud, and he threw their forces into total confusion. He twisted their chariot wheels, making their chariots difficult to drive. Let's get out of here, away from these Israelites. The Egyptians shouted, the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. When they reached the other side, the Lord said to Moses, raise your hand over the sea again. The waters will rush back and cover the Egyptians and the chariots and the charioteers. So as the sun began to rise, Moses raised his hand over the sea and the water rushed back into its usual place. The Egyptians tried to escape, but the Lord swept them into the sea. The waters returned, covered all the chariots, charioteers, the entire army of faith. The army that was the most powerful force known to humankind at this point in human history, like that, is obliterated. But, verse 29, the people of Israel had walked, you got to, through the middle of the sea. If you, if you haven't heard this story, if you've heard this story before, that's kind of lost. This is your first time hearing that story? That's like Harry Potter's. What is that? Walk through the middle of the sea on dry ground as the water stood up like a wall on both sides. That is how the Lord rescued Israel from the land of the Egyptians that day. And the Israelites saw the bodies of the Egyptians washed up on the seashore. And when the people of Israel saw the mighty power 
that the Lord had unleashed against the Egyptians, what happened? They were filled with awe. And they put their faith in the Lord and in the servant Moses. We said a couple of weeks ago that the, the only response that makes sense when you get how big our God is, is complete and total adoration and praise. Anyway, that's a different sermon. So let me show you three, th- let me show you in this text why this text is ultimately a gospel story. I mean, there's so much in here. I wish that we could spend, man, hours here. Don't have hours. Need to get you out by two o'clock. So in the end, this story is, is one that has these three elements we looked at before. Let me show you, just unpack this just kind of piece by piece. Here's the first reason this story isn't just about Exodus. This is a story that's about the gospel. And the first reason is because it's a story about an impossible rescue. An impo- isn't it? An impossible rescue. I mean, this is just a wild, crazy story. Isn't it? So, so God leads the people of, of Israel out of Egypt, but he doesn't lead them through the most direct route to the promised land. No, he leads them here and there and back again until they're jammed beneath the sea. So, I mean, they're just following the Lord, following what Moses tells them to do. But they've got to be asking, what are we doing here? Like, is this thing recalculating and we're just not clicking here? What in the world is going on? Because they're, they're basically going in a circle and they actually end up basically trapped between the Egyptian army, who when they realize that they're, what are they, they're, they're insane, what are they doing? They're just circling around and they camp by a sea. The Egyptians leave, pursue, chase, find them and trap them. And these aren't just kind police. These are like ravenous, bloodthirsty soldiers who if Pharaoh didn't say don't kill them, they would rip them to pieces. So so they're pinned up against the sea and this wall of highly trained, highly sophisticated, raw brute strength power army. And so they're like, okay, we got got two options here. Like they're in full-blown meltdown mode. We got two options. The first option is to defeat the Egyptian army. And that's just funny. Like, that's just not, that's like me going to Lambert's and eating just one roll. That's not happening. Not even an option. The second option is, hey, um, maybe we could go through the sea. Only problem is what? Seas don't work that way. You don't just walk through an ocean. So they really have no options. And they're going, listen, unless the Lord miraculously rescues us, we're done. Close curtains, the show is over. They say it's going to take a miracle to rescue us from this mess that God got us in. And listen, that, that's probably the same thing that the parents of Jessica McClure thought back in the 80s. Remember the story? 1987, October, little baby, 18 month old Jessica, is walking down her, on her aunt's property in Midland, Texas. And what happens? She steps into this abandoned well, and it's eight inches wide, which is insane, and it's 22 feet deep. Now, if you're, like, not good with feet, from this floor to this ceiling is 21 feet. And she just, and she's there for two days. Almost three, so the rescue teams, it's two and a half days, almost three days. They go through scenario after scenario after scenario. Like, well, how are we going to get this baby out of here? Because she's exposed to all kinds of elements. No food, no water, no shelter, no nothing. And so here's what, here's what they decide. Listen, the best way for us to rescue little Jessica is actually to drill another well right next to it and then make a tunnel between them and then get her out. And, and they do it. I mean, it's, by this point, man, there's this huge crowd around. The news networks are there. They pull her out. The place goes crazy. And, and listen, when they pull her out, get her to the hospital, clean her up, she walks away with a few bumps and bruises and a cut on her forehead. 22 feet, three days. And they interviewed her later, 30 years later. They said, hey, Jessica, tell us about your life. Now that you have some time to reflect, what, what, what do you have to say? And here's what she said, I quote, my life is a miracle. And listen, if that, if that, if you think that rescue is miraculous, is fascinating, then what we're reading in, in, in this story in Exodus should just blow your mind. Because you've got a people who have no weapons, no strength, no power, no strategy pinned up against the Egyptian army. And they're going, listen, the only way we can get out of here is if God rescues. Here's what nobody thought. 
Imagine they're in their tent trying to strategize what, what in the world are we going to do here? You know what nobody said at that meeting? Hey guys, uh, I don't say much, but quick suggestion. Let's just go through the sea. What do y'all think about that? Nobody said that. Because you don't do that. Because seas don't work. It's not possible to walk through a sea until it is. What happens in 1421? Moses raises his staff, and the sea splits apart. And the Israelites walk through and don't even have to wipe their feet on the rug when they get home. You want to talk about impossible rescue? Imagine telling your kids that story. How'd you get out of Egypt, mom and dad? Oh, that's a great question, baby. Um, it's kind of crazy. Like, God just opened up the ocean. No, like, really? Wow, I mean, come on. How did you actually get through the... I'm dead. He just opened up the sea. That's an impossible rescue. That's the first piece of, of this story and how this is actually a gospel story. Here's the second reason the story in Exodus. It's not just an Exodus story. It's a gospel story because it's, it's a story not just about an impossible rescue. It's a story about inadequate people. Did you see that? Like, they're just, they're stressed. I mean, they've been, in, they've been in slavery for 400 years. They're stressed. They're tired. They're exhausted. They're anxious. They're worried. They're afraid. And, and they, despite being led out of Egypt in a miraculous way, they still say in verses 10 through 12, we actually don't trust God that he is who he says he is and won't do what he says he'll do. So, so in the end, they're just a weak, feeble, struggling doubting people, which means they're a lot like us, aren't they? And, and we're a lot like them. It's completely inadequate, completely helpless, completely hopeless, completely broken apart from the love and grace and mercy of God in our lives. They have nothing to contribute to their redemption other than a lot of fear, and doubt, and confusion, and frustration, and a long history of just blowing it over, and over, and over, and over, and over again. Hey, anybody else? Anybody else had your inadequacies, your weaknesses exposed lately? I did. Just past Thursday, this last Thursday, I had to call AT&T, God help me, and I, I needed to get something fixed on my little watch deal. And I just foolishly thought this will take 10 minutes. <laughs> I mean, come on. What are you doing, man? 10 minutes? You need to block out the calendar for that much. So I called him up. And I got somebody on the phone pretty quick. Praise his name. And what do they want to know? Before I can talk to anybody, they want to know the blasted passcode to the account. I'm like, listen, man, I don't know. God, I, I got, I mean, I, I'm just looking at the account on my computer, right? I'm, a, I'm an authorized user. I see everything you're seeing. I don't really know this passcode you're talking about. He said, I'm, I'm very sorry, sir, but uh, we must have the passcode to process your request. I'm like, golly, brother, you're killing me right now. Listen, I've got like a billion passcodes in my life right now. Like, I don't know what, you just mess with me, right? There's no way you want this little four-digit number that could be anything known to man. He's the map Saudi said, we must have the password. Like, oh, God, I'm, so I'm, I'm, I'm like fuming right now. I mean, I got the kids at home, I'm trying to do dinner and bath, and, and they're just being, ugh. So I just start throwing out random stuff. I'm like, so maybe one, two, three, four? <laughs> they're like, no. I said, okay, what about uh, zero, 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 zero? Still no? What about uh, eight, six, seven, five, three, oh, nine? I don't know, man, I'm just trying to think. And ba somehow by another miraculous rescue, got the passcode. But listen, by the time that phone call was over, I was so frustrated. So my, my blood pressure was through the stratosphere. I was, just, I was just blood red. I was sweating. And as I reflected on my attitude in that phone call, and the Lord just exposed some areas of weakness and inadequacy in my life. I still lack grace. God's just trying to help me. He, he didn't know. How is he going to know my passcode? He can't tell me. I lack patience. I want what I want when I want. I'm selfish. I mean, the Lord just gently exposed all that in me. I'm just inadequate. I'm just prone to wonder. 
I just have some areas in my heart that are still wicked. Anybody else in here? Is, am I alone up here? I mean, we're just inadequate. We're just a failure. And we just need to say, yes, that's true. That's why we need Christ. An inadequate people who didn't deserve redemption. They deserved death. Who don't deserve condemnation. Who don't, don't deserve rescue. They deserve condemnation. But God. But God brings about an impossible rescue of an inadequate people. And here's the third piece here. Here's, here's the third reason why this, is, this Exodus story is a gospel story. Because it's about an improbable mediator. Mediator is somebody who steps in. That's all a mediator is. A middleman. Somebody who steps in in between two parties. And here, here's why it's improbable. Because think back to the first scenes that we see of Moses in Exodus. What's the story there? He, he, he's exposed as a dishonest, hypocritical, cowardly liar. That's his resume. And then God shows up and says, hey, Mo, you're my guy. You're going to be the guy that leads my people out of Egypt. And what does he say? Oh, I don't, I don't speak good. You know, in my mind, he sounds like Forrest Gump. I don't speak good. So what does God do? He says, it doesn't matter, man. I'm going I'm to provide. I'm going to supply. You're going to lead my people. And fast forward to this scene right here. This murderous, hypocritical, cowardly liar in the span of a few chapters is the only person in the nation who says, guys, just stay calm. Why? Because the Lord will fight for us. That's not the guy you would have expected to say that. He's the last person on planet Earth, based on what we saw first, who would say that. An improbable mediator. Now here's why I want to zoom in on this mediator part. Because what we actually see in this story is, on the one hand, Moses is so closely identified with God's people that when they grumble and complain in, in the chapter, God, you, you brought us out here to die. Moses is actually rebuked for that. God rebukes Moses for their grumbling and complaining. So he's closely identified with God's people, and yet he's so closely identified with God that all he has to do is raise a staff and an ocean splits. If you're not feeling how, how insane that is, go home, fill up your bathtub, grab a pencil, hold it up, and see what happens. You got to get in your guts how crazy that is. That is surely the Lord's grace, mercy, and power through Moses. You got an impossible rescue of an inadequate people through an improbable mediator. And that's the gospel story, is it not? Like the, the great thing about where we are in redemptive history is that we're not sitting looking at the TV guide. If, you, if you're under 20, you don't even know what that is. A TV guide waiting for the next episode to come out. Like we see how the story ends. And we see that a thousand years after Moses, another improbable mediator named Jesus was born in Nazareth. This podunk town, one stoplight, one gas station, doesn't even show up on Google Maps. Isaiah 53 says that there's, there's nothing spectacular about him at all. Isaiah 53 says he, he was as ordinary in how he walked, talked, and dressed as anybody else you know, he says you would have stood behind him in the, at the line in Target and not known you were standing behind him. He was the least likely that anybody thought would be the person to lead God's his people into redemption, to lead us out of bondage into freedom. We know that if we're just honest, see, we, we read the story and we think, man, we're probably... We always tend to read ourselves. We tend to read ourselves as, as the, the most, as the hero of the story. We're the Moses. No, you're not the Moses. You're the people of Israel who go from, from full faith to complete doubt in three verses. This is completely inadequate. And yet, because Christ was truly God, he was tempted in all the ways that Moses was, but never gave himself over. And because he's truly human, he knows what it's like to hurt. He knows what it's like to be betrayed. 
He knows what it's like to feel weak and tired and exhausted. So he's the true and better Moses come to lead us in the true and better Exodus out of the Red Sea of judgment into the promised land of hope and joy and peace and life. And so my question for you as we close is very simple, but look, look right at me. It's eternally significant. Man, I can almost taste Mother's Day lunch. Just want you to dial in for a few more minutes. Here's the question this text is pressing on us this morning. See, what you notice about the story of Exodus is you know what God did not ask as the people were walking through in faith? He didn't ask, how's your spiritual resume? Are you reading your Bible? Are you praying? Are you going to to, to tabernacle? He didn't ask any of that. It just depended on sheer faith alone, not your religious resume. So here's the question that you've got to answer before you get to lunch today. Have you put your faith in this God? I'm just not asking do you go to church. I'm not asking do you teach a Bible study. I'm not asking if you lead a ministry. I'm not asking if you pray and journal. Those are amazing things. I'm, but here, here's what I can promise you. Here's what Jesus, the true and better Moses, says over and over and over again. Religious devotion that's not rooted in genuine affection for Jesus will not be enough to get you through the Red Sea of judgment into the promised land. Only faith in God Almighty who sent his son, Jesus Christ, the true and better Moses to bear his wrath against sin on the cross, show his power over sin and the resurrection so that inadequate, completely helpless, completely hopeless, completely broken people like you and me might be set into right relationship with him. That can happen for you this morning. The question you got to answer is, have you put your faith in Jesus? Have you pushed your chips all in on who Christ is. And listen, if, if you'd be so honest, I should say, man, I, golly, I'm just listening to this. And if I'm, if I'm just straight, I just, I don't know this God you're talking, I don't know this Jesus. I've never met this God you're talking about. I know a God who's he's all about judgment and fire and brimstone and fury. I haven't met this kind of grace and mercy and love you're talking about. That's God wooing you. And my question to you is just, have you put your faith in that God? And if you'd say, no, I haven't, here's what I would lovingly but, but boldly ask you. What is keeping you from doing that? Look right at me. Right now. Like this morning. What's keeping you from doing that this morning? The offer's on the table. You don't have to die in the Red Sea. God made a way when there was no way that we might walk in freedom and life in the land of promise at the feet of Christ. That's the invitation. Have you put your faith in Christ? Would you bow your heads with me as we pray? I just want to ask a simple question. As the Lord works in this space this morning, with with heads bowed and eyes closed, I just know in a room like this, there are people who, if, if they just be so honest with themselves and with the omnipotent, omniscient God who already knows our hearts, they'd say, you know what, I, I know a lot about church. I know a lot about religion. Or they'd say, I've been chasing hope and peace and joy in a thousand other ways. But I've never met this Jesus. I've never, I've never surrendered in faith to, to this God. Would you, would you make that step? This morning I'd also ask if, if you're here and you're just weak and you're frail and you find yourself like the people in the wilderness saying, where is God gone? Has he just abandoned us, brought us out here to die? You're, you're struggling to believe. You're, you're wrestling with doubt. 
You're clinging and grasping for anything that's not sinking sand. And you just need prayer that God would restore and refresh your soul. Will you make that step? And here's what I'd ask. With every head bowed, every eye closed, if you'd say, Pastor, please pray for me this morning. I'm struggling. I just staggered it. I'm I'm only here because my mom asked me to come. Didn't expect to have an encounter with the living Lord. You're here for a reason. If that's you, would you just slip your hand up? I want to pray for you. We just want to pray over you. Nothing magical, nothing divine. You'd say, I just need prayer. You'd say, I want to take next steps. I want to know more about this God you're talking about. Would you just, just quietly slip your hand up and we'll pray for you? Father, this is an incredible story. We thank you for the rescue that you purchased for us in your life, death, and resurrection. That though we were dead in our inadequacies, dead in our weaknesses, dead in our sin, you died for us. Through an improbable redeemer that no one saw anything special in but who was God in the flesh. Stir up in us an affection for you. Save souls this morning. Give give people boldness to take a next step of faith. Pray for weary, weak, feeble souls this morning. Would Would you encourage them and strengthen them with the power of the gospel? We love you. We need you. We thank you that you're the true and better Moses who brought about a true and better and final exodus. We long for the day when we'll see you face to face. In your name we pray. Amen.